So hello and welcome to everyone who has joined us for this exciting launch of the Lancet Global Health and E-Clinical Medicine Series on maternal health in the perinatal period and beyond. My name is Tina Lavin and I'm from the Department of Sexual and Reproductive Health um, and Research at the World Health Organization. Myself and my colleagues are very excited to share with you the new findings from this series. And this has been a truly collaborative effort with more than 100 people involved across 25 countries, with two thirds of us from low to middle income countries. We're from various backgrounds and have all contributed our different perspectives to the series, from social scientists to midwives, obstetricians, gender and equity experts, and human rights and women's experts as well. Today, we have more than 1,000 people who have registered for this webinar from over 42 countries around the world, which I think speaks to the importance of this work. So just to let the audience know that we have the Q&A open, so please feel free to post your questions. We will do our best to respond as much as we can. But today is really just the start um, of the journey and the launch that we have prepared for you. So there's going to be lots happening afterwards as well that we're going to share with you in a moment. Um, I'm now going to hand over to the editors of the series. So we have Kate McIntosh from Lancet Global Health and also Bianca Brandon from eClinical Medicine uh, for some opening comments. Over to you, Kate. Thank you, Tina, um, and a warm welcome to our guests, our panel, and of course, to the authors. My name is Dr. Kate McIntosh. I'm an, I'm an editor at The Lancet Global Health, and I'm thrilled to be introducing this series on behalf of The Lancet Global Health and eClinical Medicine, who are jointly publishing what this, what we hope to be a paradigm shifting collection of papers. So as an editor in Global Health, I receive a lot of work on maternal health because of the huge death toll that pregnancy and childbirth still confer. Every two minutes in 2020, a woman died during pregnancy or childbirth, and 95% of these deaths were in low and middle income countries. Crucially, most of these deaths were preventable. Death is of course the most severe possible consequence of childbirth and the unacceptably high mortality rates must be addressed urgently. However, anyone who's had children knows that death is not the only concern for women. Even a healthy pregnancy and childbirth can have profound impacts on a woman's body and mind long after labor is finished. And anyone who's cared for a pregnant person knows that the health of that pregnancy is often heavily influenced by factors occurring long before that person even enters that first antenatal appointment. This series came about because we wanted to shift the perspective of maternal health care to recognize that pregnancy and childbirth are not a single health event that occurs in isolation, where the only important outcome is whether she or her infant die. Pregnancy and childbirth are experienced by a woman within the broad, rich context of her life, and there are many possible outcomes of each pregnancy. Pre-existing economic, social, political, and econ environmental factors will all affect a woman's health as she enters a pregnancy, as well as her vulnerability to ill health during the pregnancy, and thus the events of that pregnancy. We should not be setting the postnatal cutoff at six weeks, which does a huge disservice to the women who are still experiencing the effects of pregnancy and childbirth months, years, or even decades later, but who felt abandoned by health services that are no longer considering them postnatal. For me, it was really crucial that this series focused on the pregnant person and not on the infant. Women are often considered only as part of a mother-infant dyad, given that the health and survival of both are often influenced by similar determinants. But there are many outcomes of pregnancy that only affect the person who's given birth. I encourage you to read the commentary in the Lancet Global Health that accompanies the series from Professor Saiba Akta, an obstetrician who herself suffered obstetric fistula and a negative delivery experience. As she powerfully says, the joy of having a newborn is cherished by everyone, but the pain, physical exertion, psychological trauma and other sequelae of pregnancy and labor are borne by the mother alone. This series marks what we hope to be the beginning of a new recognition of the neglected but enduring toll that pregnancy and childbirth can take on women so we can begin to address obstetric morbidity with greater resolve. I'll now pass over to my colleague at eClinical Medicine, Bianca Brandon, who'll give an overview of the papers. Hi everyone and thanks Kate for the wonderful introduction. We're really excited to be part of the series at eClinical Medicine and share the hope for changes to both opinion and clinical practice to extend beyond this launch. So it E-clinical medicine is one half of the Lancet Discovery Science, and we focus on robust, cutting-edge clinical science. We were keen to partner on this project because we also wanted to see a novel framing of maternal health care, away from death as the only outcome and individual choices as the only determinants of maternal health. 
I took this project on for my fantastic colleague, Francesca Busitil, who was integral in planning of the series with Kate and the development of the outlines. So we are grateful to her for her contributions. At eClinical Medicine, we often publish evidence upon which clinical changes can be introduced. And this series provides a substantial evidence base to justify such changes. The first paper describes the complex interplay of factors that affect the health of a woman before, during and after pregnancy and childbirth. The authors stress the fact that a health system can mitigate or aggravate risks of pregnancy and universal healthcare within a strong health system is the most powerful tool we can use to improve health and well-being. Since 2016, only the Southeast Asia region recorded a significant decline in maternal mortality. All other regions showed either a stagnation or an increase, highlighting the timeliness of this work. The second paper describes the threats, barriers and reparative factors that interact with each other and influence the woman's experience of her pregnancy and its outcomes, with a particular focus on low and middle income countries. The paper promotes moving from rhetoric to action. The authors present evidence on the effects of various strategies to improve outcomes, recommending a life course approach with implications for policymakers, healthcare professionals and researchers. The third paper highlights just how common adverse conditions of pregnancy and childbirth can be and how long these can persist. Crucially, when investigating the prevalence and incidence of these conditions in the longer term after labour and childbirth, the authors found no reliable global or national estimates for 40% of priority conditions and no high quality guidelines on treatment from low and middle income countries, reflecting a need to prioritise this topic in research and practice. The final paper looks at maternal health through an intersectional lens in which multiple forms of power and privilege drive inequities in more than an additive way. The authors argue that healthcare experiences, including dignity and rights, are fundamental components of high quality maternal health care. They provide explanation as to how assessing differences across one dimension alone does not reflect how fundamental drivers of maternal health inequities operate. While progress has been made in some contexts, in others we have seen levelling off and sometimes reversing. Beyond the four papers, I'd also encourage those wanting to engage more with the series to read the accompanying commentaries, including a lived experience piece, a general summary and a call to action. Please also listen to the podcast, which was an interesting discussion on the messages from the series and how this work can continue in the future. We will also be releasing a video to accompany the series and all these materials can be found on the Hub page. We hope this, this series will achieve changes in both thinking and action with lasting and tangible progress. We hope to see developments in the concept of the postnatal period and how this affects maternal health beyond the standard six weeks, with adaptations to policies and practice to reduce inequities. Thank you again to the authors of the series, as well as Kate, for her commitment to this topic. Now I'm pleased to hand over to Femi, the chair of the series, from the Department of Sexual and Reproductive Health at WHO. Um, many thanks to you, Kate and Bianca, for those uh, introductory remarks, and to the Lancet, uh, the Lancet Global Health and eClinical Medicine for the vision regarding this project. Uh, we were very much encouraged by the journal's proposal about inclusivity in the authorship, and we're very proud to let you know that the series was authored by over 50 collaborators working across more than 25 countries, with more than two thirds of them from uh, low and middle income countries. Collaborators were from very backgrounds and career levels, including social scientists, midwives, obstetricians, gender and equity experts, epidemiologists, uh, public health experts, human rights experts, and women's, women's advocates, as well as community health and refugee health experts. This four-part series explores key contemporary issues affecting maternal health based on complementary papers that covers the global state of maternal health in terms of the evolution of determinants of maternal health and is linked to maternal mortality transition, the vulnerability concept and how this can be used to improve diagnosis, prevention and management of conditions during childbirth and, and, uh, and beyond, as well as the epidemiology of labor and childbirth related morbidities that are arising remotely from the time of birth as Kate alluded to uh, in her opening remarks. And lastly, the use of intersectionality approach 
in addressing major drivers of maternal health inequities. Um, and with that, I would like to introduce the speakers. I'm going to start with uh, Joe Polo Souza. Joe Polo is the Center Director of the WHO PAHO Latin American and Caribbean Center on Health Sciences Information uh, called Bireme. With a clinical background in maternal health and critical medicine, Joe Polo develops uh, graduate studies on the intersection of epidemiology and maternal health, working mainly on global health issues with a keen interest in maternal mortality, social determinants of health, knowledge translation, and health action in crisis. Dr. Souza holds a full professorship in social medicine at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. He's worked in various capacities within the WHO since 2008, uh, and he moved to power in 2022. Uh, next speaker will be Shakila Tangaratnam. Is a, she's a professor of maternal and perinatal health at the University of Birmingham in the UK, where she leads the university's maternal and reproductive health thematic area. She's the co-director of the WHO Collaborative Center for Global Women's Health at the same university. Shakila works work uh, focuses on prediction, prevention, and treatment of complications. Uh, in models with preeclampsia, epilepsy, diabetes, and obesity. She's a consultant obstetrician in the same uh, at the Birmingham Women's and Children's NHS Foundation Trust. Following Shakila will be uh, Professor Joshua Vogel, who is a senior principal research fellow at the Bonnet Institute in Australia, where he co heads the multidisciplinary global health uh, women and, uh, and newborns group. His research focuses on global maternal and prenatal health issues with a focus on improving quality of maternity care for women in resource constraints setting. Uh, he specializes in interventional research, clinical epidemiology and guideline development and implementation. And the last speaker will be uh, Megan Boren, who is an associate professor and head of gender and women's health unit at the University of Melbourne School of Population and Global Health in Australia. She is the co-director of the WHO Collaborative Center on Women's Health. Megan's research sits at the intersection between clinical epidemiology and social sciences, using innovative approaches to understand complex healthcare and societal context towards improving the quality of maternity care. The common thread of our work is around using rigorous research, participatory engagement, and authentic mentorship to elevate the voices of those marginalized by systems of power. So, and with that, I'm going to call on Joe Polo to start the presentation. Thank you, Femi, uh, for, for this very nice introduction. And I'm going to present the, the paper one, which is a global analysis of the determinants of maternal health and transitions in maternal mortality. I'm here speaking on behalf of a large number of <clears throat> collaborators that uh, supported the development of this analysis. And uh, the rationale for us to, to start is to recognize that um, uh, we are in the halfway through the journey towards the sustainable development goals. And uh, at this point, uh, we are still far from reaching the goal of reducing uh, maternal mortality to seven deaths uh, per 100,000 births globally. Uh, we are at this point on 223 maternal deaths per 100,000 live births. And um, it's important for us to, to recognize as a starting point that most maternal deaths remain preventable and largely clustered among socioeconomically disadvantaged women. And at this point also to recognize that the common approach has been uh, to direct investments to address the leading biomedical causes of maternal deaths, particularly around the perinatal uh, period. In, in this context, what, what did we do? We actually, we carried uh, uh, two uh, literature reviews uh, plus an analysis of available data related to the progress towards sustainable development goals on, on different uh, indicators of progress. And uh, the first review focuses on, on frameworks of determinants of maternal health, sort of how the, the process of production of uh, maternal health um, is, is depicted in the, the literature. 
Uh, our second review is uh, a mixed uh, methods and mood source review that looks into the micro correlates risk factors and exposures associated with maternal mortality. And uh, also we have used databases uh, related to the causes of maternal mortality and findings of uh, multi-country studies uh, on, the, the, on the pathway of uh, maternal health and mortality. Um, one of the key features of this uh, paper is uh, this uh, image that illustrated the, the relationships of the different components that leads to maternal survival and well-being, starting with the, the super determinants, uh, which is the interaction of different uh, root causes like the conditions of the planet, our uh, species, the characteristics and limitations of species, and, and the multiple interactions uh, that uh, produce a culture, our political system and economic systems that uh, produces uh, the so-called social determinants, but also uh, the exposures and lifestyles and uh, also considers the individual factors. From these different interactions, as, as you will see, um, uh, this uh, will go through a health system and this health system may be able to mitigate and change and optimize the determinants, but also um, avoid and prevent uh, the negative uh, factors related to the social determination and the uh, exposures and lifestyles, and then producing maternal survival and uh, well-being. Um, the paper starts analyzing the super determinants, uh, for instance, uh, the biosphere that we live, uh, the climate, the ecosystem, some things that are very topical at the moment, uh, but also the natural features of the human species, species for instance, the, the role of endocrinology of human parturition, the anatomy of the female pelvis, uh, but also the economic, political and cultural basis of our societies. Uh, it's super important at this point to, to recognize the, the, our impact in this planet, like the, the, uh, producing deforestation and pollution, industrialization and all that are affecting the conditions where uh, we live in the planet and affecting how health is produced in overall and particularly in maternal health. Uh, when it comes to social determinants, uh, there, are, there are various, but three of them are, are key in maternal health. The, the gender dynamics uh, in each place, in each society, um, the role of ethnicity, and also the socioeconomic class. Um, and, and these conditions also affect the exposure, the exposures and the lifestyles of women during uh, this period and the exposure to, to agents that can cause hazard and uh, infections and accidents and even violence. But also to recognize that this is not only a matter of uh, choices, but also conditioned by the, the, the social determinants and the environment where the women is. Um, and of course, this uh, uh, happens in an individual person that has characteristics like age, genetics, and pre-existing health conditions, and even the mindset towards pregnancy and shot, but which also affects the, the uh, final outcome. Um, one concept that is very key in this analysis is uh, the, the embodiment, which means that how uh, the social forces and contexts are uh, materialized and engraved in the women's uh, bodies and producing the outcome, oftentimes uh, ill health, but also uh, well-being. Um, and the role of the health system is that can be a, a modifier of these uh, forces, and but also at some point they can be permeable to the social forces. And when it's permeable, it can perpetuate um, the uh, adverse uh, factors for instance, uh, producing inequity in access to health services or, for instance, mistreatment uh, that takes place in health services as an expression of sexism or racism or uh, classism uh, when uh, we consider each health system. Um, this uh, paper also covers transitions in maternal mortality, which means that uh, to recognize that countries are in a journey of uh, towards reduction of maternal mortality. If we think on the first estimates and where we are now, we can see progress, uh, but um, a, a progress that is uh, in terms of reduction of maternal mortality that is very much correlated with social development. 
uh, we are using um, uh, a concept uh, that builds on the previous obstetric transition that we are calling now a transitions in maternal mortality that works on stages and uh, um, where we classify countries in, in the different stages according to the levels of maternal mortality. And recognizing that this uh, is a, a continuous process where uh, the stages are based on maternal mortality levels. Uh, we present this uh, uh, table where we can see the distribution of the number of the countries per, uh, obstet, uh, per the transition stages. And here I just want to highlight that in, in the stage one, that is a number of countries with more than uh, 500 deaths per 100,000. In 2000, we had 41 countries in that category, and now we have 19 showing progress. And we can also see in the bottom uh, one where we see the number of countries uh, increasing. But despite the progress, there's a substantial number, more than 120 countries, which remain in the same stage. So the key messages in this uh, paper uh, means that uh, maternal uh, mortality is a social uh, issue that we need a, a broad approach and that focusing only on the biomedical approach is largely insufficient. Um, there is uh, the need for multi-sectoral action and the important role, the fundamental role of the health sector. That is in the provision of the quality commodities and services are needed and, and the universal health coverage as a, as a fundamental tool for us to produce uh, a reduction in maternal mortality and um, promote health and well-being. Thank you. Uh, Tina will play now a, a video for us on this paper. Determinants of maternal health. In global health, factors affecting maternal survival and well-being are crucial considerations. Elements such as environment, cultures, economies, and politics are interconnected. They play an important role in shaping our world, influencing health systems, and the health and well-being of everyone, everywhere. This figure shows how maternal survival and well-being is a product of a complex interplay of factors, beginning with superdeterminants, like the conditions of the planet and the innate characteristics of the human species through evolution. The continuous interactions of these superdeterminants, the impact of humans on the planet and vice versa, shape cultural, political and economic systems that influence social determinants, lifestyle and individual factors that can promote or hinder good health and well-being. This figure helps to show that lifestyle and other exposures are not only necessarily a result of individual choices, but can be influenced by social forces and contexts and caused by root factors such as the economic situation. A strong and resilient health system functions like a filter that can modify or mitigate these underlying factors to improve maternal survival and well-being. However, the figure also communicates that health systems are influenced by these external forces as well. For example, mistreatment, disrespect, and abuse within health services are expressions of structural racism or gender bias. In other words, the health system was permeable to adverse social forces and materialized these forces into a form of institutional violence. On the other hand, a strong health system is less permeable to social forces and contexts, providing good quality maternal health services to all. In order to have an impact on reducing maternal mortality, we must promote social development, including gender rights and equity, at the same time as promoting universal health coverage with quality services and commodities. Now I will hand over to Shakila, which will present the second paper. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, just trying to activate my video, Tina. It's my pleasure to present the paper two of the series, Vulnerabilities and Reparative Strategies During Pregnancy, Childbirth, and the Postpartum Period. 
I would like to thank all of the contributors who have made this paper a reality. So I would like to start by saying uh, what's vulnerability. It's defined as a state where an individual can be exposed to various risk factors uh, in the background of a lack of support or coping strategies to neutralize the adverse effects. And particularly in maternal health, this can manifest as uh, changes physically or physiologically, emotional changes on the background of limited access to resources. And these vulnerability can occur throughout pregnancy, childbirth, and the postpartum period. So what did we set out to do? We first wanted to map the existing vulnerability concepts and models that have been published. We wanted to look at the magnitude of association between the various vulnerability attributes in maternal health and the pregnancy outcomes. We also wanted to show an example of, of the dynamic influence of how these vulnerability attributes are interlinked and look at existing evidence for reparative strategies to address these. So what did we do? We undertook a systematic review of systematic reviews uh, where we mapped the vulnerability concepts and the association by looking at both observational as well as randomized studies. And for reparative strategies, we focused on reviews of randomized studies, all of these in low and middle income countries. We found four systematic reviews that provided various vulnerability module models and concepts. And we underpinned a framework uh, using the Briscoe's review, which had three components, threats, barriers, and repair. So this is a figure in the paper. As you can see on the left side, you have the threats, which could either be a psychological threat, biological and so or sociological. And we also looked at the various barriers um, that affect women and what is meant by repair. So this figure highlights the framework, the vulnerability trajectory so at the very top end, the line shows this is the optimal health for the woman. And at the, at the bottom is the adverse outcome of maternal death. And this happens throughout pregnancy, early pregnancy, late pregnancy, birth, immediate postpartum and beyond. And the, the line in the middle shows the vulnerability trajectory. A woman who has who is facing threats and barriers is already as a disadvantage when she enters early pregnancy. So for example, let's think about a 17 year old teenage mother who already enters pregnancy with iron deficiency and calcium defici deficiency. On top of that, if she does face barriers to access healthcare, then she is not going to have regular healthcare checkups. Her preeclampsia when she develops is going to be missed and she very likely is going to come into the hospital with severe preeclampsia, which necessitates a cesarean section followed by postpartum hemorrhage and with the under underlying anemia, this makes things even worse. And the, the, the green arrows at the top shows the missed opportunities where we could have avoided this outcome. So in early pregnancy, nutritional supplementation could have prevented and treated the iron deficiencies and calcium deficiency a regular antenatal monitoring and a supportive antenatal care could have identified preeclampsia early and prevented the adverse outcomes. A supportive and uh, well-nurturing healthcare system during birth would uh, allow the mother to have optimal outcomes and could have prevented uh, the postpartum hemorrhage linked adverse outcomes. So we looked at the threats and barriers women face in early pregnancy, late pregnancy, and childbirth. So this is not all of the um, vulnerability indices, but these are the indices for which there is existing evidence in the form of systematic reviews. We found that violence against women, be it an intimate partner violence or the state of where she is living, life in fragile and conflict affected states, as well as her refugee and asylum seeker status, predisposed the mother and her baby 
to complications. Child marriage, adolescent pregnancies, and low maternal education were also the other risk factors for poor outcomes. When we looked at late pregnancy, a lot of the previous vulnerabilities also continued to affect the mother and her unborn baby. Additionally, we also found evidence for nutritional deficiencies like calcium and iron, uh, maternal risk exposures in terms of alcohol, smoking, her mental health like depression, poverty, as well as the first time pregnancies were uh, risk factors for poor outcomes. In terms of childbirth, we found that disrespect and abuse, if the women felt that they were discriminated or in fact were discriminated and mistreated during childbirth, the most vulnerable state of the mother, uh, this resulted in their hesitancy in accessing facility-based births, predisposing them to complications. Religious and cultural practices which were focused on women also contributed to poor outcomes, such as female genital mutilation. Additionally, lack of resources, as well as poor quality of resources, as well as poor quality of care, all added on to poor outcomes. So how can we repair these vulnerabilities? Compared to the long list of the vulnerabilities that we found earlier, this is the evidence base that we have on how these can be tackled. So we have evidence that treating anemia and calcium deficiency can improve pregnancy outcomes in terms of risk exposure, smoking, mental health, and intimate partner violence. There are evidence to have a positive impact with these interventions. And for us to tackle the barriers in terms of low maternal education, contraceptive promoting interventions for unintended pregnancies, as well as community interventions for antenatal care access, all resulted in improved pregnancy outcomes. We are still a long way to go. This series, hopefully, will shine a light on the concept of vulnerability and justifies access for increased resources at country level for maternal health. We do need to prioritize women's access to education and empowerment because this has a direct impact on the health during pregnancy and beyond, including investment in contraceptive uptake programs. Healthcare professionals need to have a shift in their care approach from a specific syndrome-based management to a life course approach, capturing the women's vulnerability trajectory throughout and where possible to use locally validated tools. We need good data to make sense of what's happening there, particularly standardized data so that we can combine evidence across multiple settings and multiple countries. We need to evaluate programs. We need more evidence on what works, what doesn't work, and what needs to be done to make these interventions work. In particular, we need to identify the root cause of mistreatment during childbirth and tackle this. Critical to all of these is the voice of the woman as well as her family and community. So we do need to involve patients and public to be involved and engaged in all of the activities that we plan in order to tackle the various vulnerabilities. So I'll end up with the first key message that vulnerability is centered around threats, barriers, and reparations that are all constantly interacting with each other and we should not forget this dynamic influence that's affecting the women's vulnerability trajectory. And the other one is we all have an ethical obligation to make sure the vulnerability indices and attributes are tackled to improve the pregnancy outcome. Thank you. I shall hand over to Josh now to share his paper. Thanks very much, um, Shakila. I'll just ask if um, Tina can um, start my video. Um, we can um, move now to the third paper in the series, um, which focuses on the uh, neglected medium and long-term consequences of labour and childbirth. Um, I want to um, start by um, acknowledging and thanking the 
21 authors from 11 high, middle uh, and low income countries who contributed to this uh, really important and um, challenging piece of work. Um, we've heard from earlier presenters um, and from our um, editors that um, there's been a global focus on uh, ending preventable maternal mortality for some decades now. And that has necessarily resulted in a um, very specific focus on addressing acute obstetric emergencies such as postpartum hemorrhage, uh, preeclampsia and peripartum sepsis. And those are very important issues. Um, but one other factor is that um, there's been a comparative neglect of other longer term complications. These conditions tend to be chronic and certainly affect much more women than is commonly appreciated. Um, when we say medium and longer term, we mean um, conditions that occur after six weeks postpartum. And in most parts of the world, postpartum uh, maternity services tend to end around that period. Um, and this means that there's a lot of conditions that affect a large amount of women. Um, they are linked to pregnancy and childbirth, but they may only present a month or even years later. And one common theme across a lot of these conditions is the dramatic um, health, social and economic consequences that they cause for women, for their families and uh, uh, more broadly for communities. So the aim of our paper was to dig into this issue of these medium and long-term complications. We were interested in identifying what epidemiological data there is on the burden and also looking at high quality clinical guidelines on prevention, identification and management. We had a particular interest on the implications for women and providers in low middle income countries, but our searches were global. This schematic is designed to try and um, help us understand um, where these medium and long-term complications come from. Now, on a certain level, um, we can think of these as medical or biological issues. Um, there are physical, hormonal, anatomical cha uh, changes during pre pregnancy. And that increases the likelihood um, of a woman developing complications in the medium to longer term. But that would be a far too um, simplistic view. Um, as we've heard from our two uh, previous papers, um, we need to consider the uh, vulnerabilities and the broader environmental, social and physical context that women inhabit and how those factors interact um, and can also increase the propensity of longer term uh, complications. Particularly critical is that window of time around the uh, labour and childbirth. Um, complications that occur during that time not only increase the likelihood of complications in the short term, but also in the long term. Um, intrapartum interventions can be critical, they can be life saving, but as we know in many parts of the world, overuse and misuse of intrapartum interventions has been rising. And this means a lot of um, avoidable harm is caused by unnecessary use of interventions, which merely increases the number of women who are experiencing avoidable long term complications. These factors can all be interacting. Um, and as you can see from this um, diagram, there is not only a huge number of complications that can occur, but these can even uh, affect those women who go on um, to have a subsequent pregnancy and cause other avoidable complications uh, for her and that baby. In searching for data, we cast a very wide net, searching for systematic reviews and high, uh, highly representative um, survey data sets. Unfortunately, we found limited data and um, data that was not of particularly high quality we have a very limited understanding of how common these conditions are. This graph shows a selection of prevalence data um, for those conditions where we found evidence that it may affect more than 10% of postpartum women. As you can see, this ranges from sexual dysfunction, um, various types of incontinence, mental health issues, and chronic pain. In addition, and uh, not less importantly, but less uh, a lower prevalence are other types of conditions across a range of organ systems as well. And um, a number of these conditions have very serious impacts on women's health and well-being. Most concerningly, we found no data, no systematic reviews or representative data for several medium to long-term conditions, meaning we have no data to guide policymakers, health services, clinicians, and other stakeholders on where to direct resources in their health systems uh, to address these conditions. Unfortunately, the data that we do have is limited. Um, it was great to see prevalence data um, from some countries, but these are predominantly high income countries with well resourced health systems. By and large, very little population representative data from low and middle income countries. And for those conditions where we do have data, there are differences in prevalence, which may be attributable to the way we measure it or how those studies were performed, meaning that there's a lot of uncertainty about what exactly the prevalence may be. This is particularly evident in our studies from low middle income countries where there was a particular reliance on facility based studies which tend to produce biased results. 
In terms of clinical guidelines, uh, we looked at um, uh, what guidelines were published since 2010 across all these conditions, identifying 46 high quality guidelines. Unfortunately, many conditions we identified no guidelines. All of these guidelines were issued from high income countries, um, although several were issued by WHO for international use. We found none that were developed by an LMIC based uh, organization. A common theme across these uh, 46 guidelines was the fact that we can't consider these as, uh, as narrow um, clinical or medical complications because women experience such a profound range of impairments. Um, they can affect their function, their emotions, their behavior, um, their sex lives, and also their quality of life more broadly. And health services need to rise up uh, and be able to provide care that responds to that range of impairment um, that women experience. A number of guidelines are recommending systematic, uh, systematic clinical assessments and validated tools that can be used to actually screen and identify women at risk. That means that we have tools by which we can identify women as early as possible um, and treatment can be, uh, 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 can be commenced promptly and uh, a lot of um, suffering can be avoided. So key messages from this paper is that more and better measurement of medium to long-term consequences of childbirth is urgently required. The scarcity of prevalence evidence is particularly profound in low middle income countries, except for a couple of um, uh, mental health conditions where we did find examples of good data. So such studies are possible. There's also a need for us to converge on standardized measurement approaches and study designs so we can get reliable, comparable and population re representative prevalence data to guide decision making. Guidelines themselves are necessary, not sufficient alone, but they are a critical step on the pathway to improving outcomes. There's clearly a, um, the capacity to produce high quality guidelines evidenced by those that exist for some conditions, but we need more for more conditions and better guidelines that are tailored to the settings in which majority of women are experiencing these complications. That is a critical pathway to identifying women at risk, preventing these complications from occurring, but also managing them if they do occur. Another key message is that we have an opportunity here to develop better services that are more responsive and women centered around the postnatal period. These models of care need to be tailored to working in limited resource settings, and that is a long overdue um, issue. This means that, um, it's, uh, that good quality care in the postpartum period is not just a privilege for those who live in well-resourced health systems that can be um, accessed by postpartum women the world round. So we would invite every, all the attendees today and uh, those reading our series to join us in this call for greater recognition, improved measurement and collective action around these medium to long-term complications. But we need not wait. Um, there are things that we can do today. We can, for example, um, ask those who work at the coalface in clinical services or look after those services. How can we improve current care, current care arrangements? How do we better prevent, identify and provide care for women with these complications based on the resources that we have now? A critical element of that is providing good quality information on prevalence to women, their, um, what they can do to improve their own health and how they can recognise danger signs and know where to access health services. Most critically, we can amplify the voices of women. Think about how critical that consumer and uh, women's ad, cons consumer organisations, women's advocacy groups have been um, to mobilising action in other areas, such as the obstetric fistula uh, community. This is an opportunity to uh, bring uh, community around these conditions as well. But there's also a future agenda. Um, and we've been challenging WHO and other organizations to rethink what does postpartum mean? The risks of uh, pregnancy and childbirth persist much longer than the traditional 42 days. Perhaps we need to rethink um, if that's an appropriate threshold for health services. And we, if we invest in research and guideline development today, we'll have better data and better guidance for clinicians tomorrow. So this is something that needs to um, come to the attention of donors and funders of research uh, and uh, guideline development. And critically, we want health policies to better meet the real needs of women. And there will be people listening today who are involved in health policy development. And I would like to close by leaving uh, all of us with a couple of quotes from the lived experiences of women who have had to endure um, complications of uh, childbirth. Um, that otherwise um, could have been avoidable through provision of good quality care around the time of birth. Thanks very much. I'd now like to hi uh, hand over to Megan Byron, who's presenting paper four.
Megan, you're on mute. Thanks, Tina. We are living through a time of renewed onslaught against sexual and reproductive health and rights, and at the juxtaposition of a climate emergency, political instability, armed conflict, and economic crises. Alongside this complex social, environmental, and political global landscape, we've heard throughout this webinar today about the stagnating progress in maternal health over the last decade. Our paper four in this series offers an opportunity to address some of these burning issues that are restricting global progress. In this paper, we explore how we can eradicate inequities in maternal health by addressing intersectional gendered power relations. I'd like to acknowledge our brilliant team of co-authors who came, come from more than 10 countries and from very uh, diverse and multidisciplinary backgrounds who made this paper a reality. Improving access to and use of quality maternity care services to reduce maternal morbidity and mortality have been critical goals for the maternal health community throughout the Millennium Development Goal and Sustainable Development Goal eras. However, despite decades of effort, Inequalities in access, in use, and health outcomes remain persistent and profound. For instance, women from minority racial or ethnic groups, women of lower socioeconomic status, women with disabilities, and people giving birth who don't identify as women may be more likely to experience intersectional discrimination across multiple fronts that results in poorer health outcomes and poorer healthcare experiences. In paper four of this series, we argue for a more comprehensive and holistic approach to maternal health that balances the emphasis on clinical care and health outcomes with experiential aspects of quality of care, such as healthcare experiences and reproductive autonomy, which have historically been left behind in the maternal health community. We argue that both clinical care and healthcare experiences are profoundly shaped by intersectional gendered power relations which are largely driving the inequities that we see in maternal health outcomes today. In this paper, we had four main activities. We begin by describing how intersectional gender power relations drive maternal health inequities and how we might go about beginning to address them. We present a new inequalities analysis using an intersectional lens to illustrate the strengths and opportunities of this approach and what might be lost in its absence. We then review and map equity-informed interventions in maternal health in order to identify opportunities for improvement and areas for future innovation. And lastly, we make recommendations to communities of research, policy, and clinical practice on how we can reimagine and co-create new intersectionality-informed approaches to maternal health. Intersectionality is an approach rooted in Black feminist theory and praxis and it encourages the exploration of how different types of power and privilege, and conversely, oppression and exclusion, are interconnected and co-constitutive. What this means is that intersectionality highlights the importance and complexity of reckoning with multiple social identities that people have, and how these social identities influence how they navigate the world, including in maternal health and maternal health care services. These intersecting power relations shape people's lives, as well as the social norms and the moral codes that govern relationships within families, within communities, and beyond. These intersecting power relations also play out at higher levels of society, in health policy, across medical curricula, and in legal systems. Intersectionality foregrounds inequities and injustices that mark maternal health. For example, Pregnancy and childbirth are explicitly tied to sexuality, sexual health, reproductive health, and human rights. And all of these are governed by heteronormative gendered power relations. Using an intersectionality approach is powerful as it allows for explicit exploration of how gendered power relations interact with other sources of inequality to shape or impair agency, cultural expectations, and access to resources, support, and care during the perinatal period and beyond. Women and birthing people may have limited agency and bodily autonomy throughout pregnancy and childbirth. For instance, this might include limited autonomy over the decision to seek health care or the financial means to do so. Or it can come from the fear that about gendered assumptions about pregnant bodies that might result in lack of gender affirming health care. People can be mistreated during childbirth, particularly when there are organizational challenges to providing care, as we heard from Xiao Paulo earlier. 
other deep sources of deep rooted sources of discrimination further intensify gender discrimination, including things like casteism, racism, ableism, and transphobia. There are many instances of racism that are deeply ingrained into health and social policies that govern maternal health and maternal health care. For instance, gendered racism is revealed and persists in stereotypes that stigmatize Black motherhood. Gendered racism can manifest with health workers lab labeling Black women as difficult patients or maternity care practices that leave Black women feeling unsafe, unheard, or dismissed. All of these contribute to the continued racial inequities in maternal health and health outcomes and experiences that we see today. It's critical to note that this gendered racism has historical roots. Enslaved black women were surgically experimented on without their consent or pain management by the father of modern surgical gynecology, James Marion Sims throughout the 1800s. In Australia, Government policies forcibly removed Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander babies and children from their families, placing them with non-Indigenous families. These experiences have led to compounding cycles of intergenerational trauma, including broken cultural, spiritual, and family ties, and have contributed substantially to distrust in health systems and inequitable health and well-being outcomes. Within the context of maternal health, Intersectionality analysis encourages the consideration of women and birthing people as agents of the powers that govern their own lives, rather than a sum of their social identities. Intersectionality analysis can therefore contribute to deeper and more nuanced understanding of how and why birthing people can simultaneously be privileged yet disempowered. To illustrate the power of intersectionality analysis in maternal health, we conducted an analysis of demographic and health survey and mixed data on the relationship between antenatal care quality and socioeconomic deprivation status. We conducted this analysis across eight Latin American and Caribbean countries where we could standardize ethnicity to indigenous, Afro-descendant, or other. This equiplot shows that in general, women who are more socioeconomically deprived tend to receive lower quality antenatal care compared to less deprived women. When this socioeconomic deprivation is combined with ethnic disadvantage, it further contributes to a decrease in the quality of antenatal care. This underscores the significance of employing an intersectionality informed analytical approach, as these approaches recognize that the overlapping oppressions of ethnicity and socioeconomic deprivation cannot be simply addressed by a unique dimensional measure of deprivation. Recognizing that we could measure the effects of intersecting oppressions and privileges in our data, we next sought to deepen that understanding of how intersectionality and equity-informed approaches have been used in existing maternal health interventions. To do so, we conducted a scoping review of interventions that used either intersectionality or equity-informed approaches to address social power relations or inequities in maternal health. In brief, our inclusion criteria were interventions that were to promote equality or equity, or to reduce inequality or inequity, or use intersectionality-informed approaches, and also that they used an interventional uh, design and included a quantitative evaluation. In brief, we found that socioeconomic status was by far the most common social factor that was accounted for in about half of intervention designs through interventions such as vouchers and fee subsidies to improve access to healthcare services, or cash transfers uh, when people did use healthcare services. We also found that socioeconomic status um, was uh, accounting for over 50% of the target populations, which typically focused on people experiencing poverty or people experiencing food insecurity. And looking at outcome evaluations, over 80% of interventions um, were evaluating based on uh, wealth status. We also found that very few interventions were specifically aimed to improve racial or ethnic inequalities or targeted people from ethnic minorities or indigenous groups. Only about 25% of interventions reported their outcomes based on things like place of residence, age, race, ethnicity, culture, or language. And less than 10% reported outcomes based on things like employment status, gender, religion, migration, or refugee status. Collectively, what the scoping review shows us is that most interventions address uh, solely economic inequalities throughout design, population, and outcome evaluation. 
While addressing economic inequalities are critical to leaving no one behind, much more work is needed to understand the complexities of these inequities and how other social identities such as migration or refugee status, indigenous identity, so sexual orientation, or gender identity may reinforce or alleviate power imbalances in maternal health and healthcare. We also found that most studies focused on improving access to and use of maternal health care services, with only a minority focusing on improving quality of care, including experiences and satisfaction with care. Given the strong evidence of mistreatment and discrimination in maternal health care settings, and the influence of poor experiences of care on future health behaviors like we heard from Shakila, more interventional work is urgently needed to address these important but neglected areas of maternal health. Moving forward, we make recommendations for practice, research, and policy. We recommend establishing intersectionality, multidisciplinarity, trauma-informed, and social justice approaches as grounding principles of clinical practice. And these uh, methods can provide a way forward to improve maternal health and healthcare. From a research perspective, we recommend catalyzing research on intersectionality and maternal health justice using strength-based approaches, including things like community-based participatory research, feminist research, critical and decolonial ontologies. And these research methods have the power to democratize knowledge creation for community-led action. Professional associations, accrediting bodies, and licensing organizations can likewise support efforts to embed intersectionality into clinical practice by reviewing their curriculums and looking into support um, people coming up from different sorts of backgrounds. Lastly, policy plays a critical role in creating and upholding power relations that drive inequities and thus can be a powerful tool to rectify them. For example, the current United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Right to Health has framed her mandate in the context of intersectionality, which has the power to push our global policy uh, to be more informed by powerful principles like intersectionality. We acknowledge that these efforts will require medical and health institutions themselves to begin reckoning with the power structures within medicine and healthcare that reinforce inequities. We acknowledge that this is a tricky territory to be in and we encourage people to step up and have the courage to do so. Much has been accomplished by increasing access to and coverage of maternal health care services. However, a substantial unfinished agenda remains to ensure maternal well-being, rights, and justice for all. And this is a common theme across the four papers in this series. Many of the maternal health inequities that we describe in paper four are viewed by the global and maternal health communities as entrenched and immovable. Yet these inequities are entrenched only insofar as the global health community continues to leave underlying structural drivers unaddressed. We offer a set of possible new research, policy, and clinical practice approaches that seek to address the challenges of eradicating these entrenched inequities. This list is not exhaustive and absolutely should not be viewed as a checklist for doing intersectional equity for maternal health. Of course, there will be no single way to ensure that an intersectional equity will work for all people and in all settings. Rather, we hope that these reflections spur the global health community and specifically the maternal health community to imagine, invent, and co-create new approaches that move the world closer to a better, more equitable, and just future. Thank you. And now I'll hand over to Femi to wrap up. Thanks, Megan. And thanks to all the speakers for their presentations. But to better understand the importance of the various themes that emerge from these presentations, we need to put maternal health in the right context. The world we live in right now is very much different from the one that we lived in in the 1990s and in 2000, when the safe motherhood programs were being rolled out across many countries. Since the adoption of the SDGs in 2015, our world has drastically changed in several ways that have profound implications for both health systems and the health of all humans uh, everywhere, but especially for pregnant women. There is the demographic shift that has been dominated by an aging population in almost every country, alongside increasing urbanization everywhere. Uh, we heard about the climate change uh, issue and the environmental degradation that has accelerated uh, in recent times, imagined as one of the greatest threats to, uh, to human health in the 21st century. There's increasing inequities within and between, between countries leading to further divide in socioeconomic outcomes between populations 
uh, where those who have versus those who don't tend to have disparities in their health outcomes. And then political instability and conflicts, including armed conflicts, with increasing emphasis on national self-sufficiency, as we can see across many countries. But then there's also the technological advances that we've seen. It's brought the world into a new era uh, where we, we now have the opportunity to advance healthcare and improve health decision-making. But the downsides are that there is also risk in terms of serious inequities that could arise from this, as well as the threats that is posed by uh, artificial intelligence, misinformation and disinformation. All of these have profound effects on maternal health and maternal health outcome. The series papers are calling on all stakeholders to look at maternal health in the current context and customize strategies accordingly to ensure that the SDG targets are back on track. I'm not gonna go into too much details about the specific uh, papers, but to summarize, the series is calling on all stakeholders, women and women's groups, ministries of health, implementers, uh, including NGOs and CSOs, um, professional associations, academic research institutions, industries and private sectors, as well as donor agencies, to pay attention to how the recent changes in our world are affecting pregnancy and childbirth outcomes and invest in a coordinated agenda to improve maternal health and well-being. We hope that these four papers will spark new ideas on how we can better collaborate to tackle the persistent and profound inequities in maternal health care and outcomes that actually should be non-existent in 2023. And here is the, the QR code that you, just a second, yeah, there is a QR code that will take you to the, sorry, I don't know if anybody else is controlling, yeah, just leave it. That's the QR code where you could, uh, that will take you to the series hub where you can download all the series papers and the three accompanying commentaries. Uh, we'll encourage you to read all of the papers. There are seven of them, three commentaries and four series papers. Uh, and with that, I'm gonna hand over to uh, Professor Asher George to moderate the next session. Uh, by introduction, Professor Asher George is the South African Research Chair in Health Systems complexity and social change at the School of Public Health, University of Western Cape in South Africa. She chairs the scientific and technical advisory group for the United Nations Special Program on Human Reproduction, HRP, which is situated at the Department of Sexual and Reproductive Health and Research at the WHO in Geneva. And she's a former board chair of the Health System Global. Her work in gender and health systems started with her ethnography on health systems accountability and maternal mortality in Kopal district in India in the 2000s. Through her allyship in activism, uh, United Nations Agency in Academia, she has nurtured various networks engaged in sexual and reproductive rights, health systems, and gender. Welcome, Asha. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's been really a tremendous um, um, series with marking so many collaborations and authors that have come together. And I was really struck by the papers, the presentations, but also to take this moment to recognize um, that the series is really talking about power and inequalities. And I thought it was a fitting tribute to Dr. Mahmoud Fatala, who was a former director of the department, um, uh, the Human Reproduction Program and the Department of Reproductive Health Research was one of the first, I'd say, feminist directors of that program and really brought to heart that why are women dying of maternal mortality? It's not because we don't know what to do. It's because societies haven't decided that they care enough to change the way programs and services are organized um, to make sure that they don't die. Um, so I think that's an excellent fitting tribute, the series really speaks to the way in which he championed maternal health. And we have a very exciting panel um, that will really take us to uh, understanding not only key insights about the papers, but how does it speak to 
their everyday practice um, realities. They're champions in health systems nationally, regionally, and glo globally. So I'm going to read, we have a very esteemed panel, very briefly to introduce the panelists. Uh, we have Professor Hadisa Galadanchi. She's a professor of, of obstetrics and gynecology in the College of Health Sciences, Bayero, University of Kano, Nigeria, and the director of a World Bank supported Africa Center of Excellence for Population Health and Policy. She has an established research network and has published over 100 articles focused on research topics such as safe motherhood, PMTCT, and cervical cancer. She's joined by Professor Fisaki Lumbinganon. He's the president of the Royal Thai College of Obstetrics and Gynecologists and the current president of the Asia Oceania Federation of Obstetrics and Gynecology. He was dean of the Faculty of Medicine, Konkan University, and he works uh, in multiple roles as a clinician, teacher, supervisor, trainer, researcher, and champion for maternal health. He's the regional editor of WHO Reproductive Health Library and the con convener of um, Cochrane Thailand. And finally, last but not least, we have Professor Rani Thakur, uh, who's the president of the Royal College of Obstetrics and Gynecologists in the UK. She um, is a consultant at Croydon University Hospital and an honorary senior lecturer at St. George's University of London. She's an experienced leader with a clear understanding of the operational clinical and training demands facing the speciality today, winning various awards for her contributions to the field. So I can think of nothing better than this esteemed panel to really think of uh, how the series contributes to advancing the field since they're such clear advocates. Maybe starting first with Hadisa, uh, you've spent so many years working in your country in Nigeria, providing services to many vulnerable women. Um, perhaps some thoughts on how you see the series um, shaping what you do nationally in your everyday clinical practice and in your sphere of influence. Over to you, thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Asha, uh, for this question and really an exciting, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, series. Um, uh, really, as a clinician, I think what is important is that this information that we have gathered in this Lancet series has to get beyond, you know, the few people that will probably read it. We need a lot of dissemination. A lot of dissemination. People need to know to be reminded of, uh, you know, the other uh, determinants of maternal health beyond just the clinical condition that a woman has. We need to talk about the super determinants, the social determinants, the health system uh, determinants, so that when you're managing that patient, you're managing her holistically. You're not just managing her just the single you know, condition of eclampsia or postpartum hemorrhage, it goes beyond that. You need to consider her holistically. At the same time, you need to consider the lifetime course because really this woman comes from a community and she's going to go back to that community and continue her life even after the pregnancy. And especially this issue of the long-term uh, complications that have been neglected so what you've done in antenatal or intrapartum care might really affect this woman for the rest of her life. So as clinicians, we need to be reminded. Now, apart from dissemination in terms of publication, we need to include this into our training. Uh, the trainings of our healthcare workers, we need to both for the pre-service training as well as the in-service training. We need to remind trainees of the importance of you know, this determinants and the vulnerabilities that are associated with maternal health. And then also, apart from, um, you know, the in-service and the, uh, the post-service, we also need guidelines. As clinicians, we need guidelines. We've heard in the third paper that really, for guidelines for long-term complications, we really don't have so many. Um, and most of them are from um, you know, um, um, uh, from the high income countries. So we need guidelines for the low income countries for us to be able to be guided so that we can treat this 
women holistically. So as a healthcare provider, I think this is an important, uh, uh, you know, um, opening uh, reminder, because as you've said, we've known it for long, but it's just a reminder for us. And I think we need to incorporate it and inculcate it into our clinical uh, our practice. Thank you so much, Hadisa. I mean, you spoke about dissemination, but I think you were talking about mindsets, changing mindsets of how we think about what are the solutions and the immediate priorities for maternal health and really music to my ears since I'm at a university in terms of advancing training, but also pushing WHO in its business in supporting evidence-based guidelines, but adapting that to local context. So important. Thank you so much for sharing. Over to um, Pisake Lumbangnan, who's in Thailand, who um, le is now leading this regional, the Asia Pacific Society uh, for Obstetrics and Gynecology. What do you think are key priorities that the series speaks to for your work in the region? You're on mute. Just a few minutes. Wonderful, thanks. Thank you very much, Asha, for your car introduction. The Asia Oceania Federation of Obstetrics and Gynecology, or AOFO, was established in 1957 with the main objectives to promote the science and art of obstetrics, gynecology, and reproductive biology, to promote total health care in females throughout life, as well as to promote international cooperation and goodwill, particularly in Asia and Oceania region. In AOFOC region, currently we have 22 active National Society members. 11 countries have intermediate maternal mortality ratio between 100 and 299. Six countries have low MMR between 20 to 99. And only five countries have very low MMR that is less than 20. During 2022 to 2024, AOFOC has been focusing on four important issues related to maternal health. These include reduction of maternal mortality and morbidity, with special emphasis on postpartum humiliation in collaboration with WHO, reduction of unnecessary cesarean section. Thailand and Vietnam are currently participating in the implementation research using non-clinical intervention to reduce unnecessary cesarean section with the World Health Organization and European Commission. This may be expanded later to other countries in the region. Prevention and management of violence against women and intimate partner violence. Effect of climate change on sexual and reproductive health and what OBGYN should do. We have special working group to move this issue forward. AOFOC, in collaboration with the Obstetrical Gynecological Society of Malaysia, has been organizing intensive calls on obstetric emergency for countries in the region with high MMR. We will continue doing this. AOFOC is working with Furring Concept Foundation and WHO in getting heat stable cabetocin at a price similar to oxytocin for 14 eligible low-income countries and lower-middle-income countries in the region. Hopefully, these countries will have better quality medicine for the prevention of postpartum humiliation. AOFOC has been disseminating the WHO recommendation related to maternal health, for example, antenatal care, induction of labor, intrapartum care, prevention and treatment of postpartum humiliation, non-clinical intervention to reduce unnecessary cesarean section, by webinars or workshops. Hopefully, this will reduce preventable causes of maternal mortality and morbidity, as well as reduce unnecessary biomedical intervention or over-medicalization, especially for intrapartum care, including induction and augmentation of labor, cesarean section, IV fluid administration, routine electronic fetal monitoring, routine episotomy, we will continue doing this activity. AOFOC should encourage national society in the region to move forward the universal health coverage policy, which is essential for reducing maternal mortality 
and ensuring access to quality care during pregnancy and childbirth. In the future, AOFOC can participate in future multi-center implementation research with either WHO or other organizations to improve maternal health. Finally, AOFOC should seriously and widely inform the national society in the region that focusing solely on biomedical causes of maternal mortality is insufficient. A broader approach is necessary to tackle determinants that act upstream in the chain of events, leading to severe morbidity and mortality. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, to it's so important to have a regional organization such as yours, particularly in Asia, where we know that maybe the overall levels of maternal mortality are lower, but the inequalities are quite large. And if you think of paper four, talking about intersectionality, the lack of access or the different outcomes for women for, who are migrants in Asia, women from ethnic minorities are quite extreme. And I think this series has a lot to speak to them. You spoke about the important championship in terms of access to treatment, but also dealing with, which paper three dealt with, the problems with um, regulating that treatment once you receive it so that you don't have over prescription or bad quality care as well. So a whole range of things. And I think it's an excellent, your presentation is an excellent segue for our last panelist, Rani Thakur, who's in the UK and is also uh, a leader of the Royal Society of Obstetrics and Gynecologists. Listening to the previous panelists and from your own perspective, what do you think are key actions that are emanating from the series that uh, you would like to champion from your position, both locally and globally? Over to you. So, so this data is really important for the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Just in way of introduction, uh, we are a college based in London. Uh, and although we are UK focused, uh, we also have a huge global uh, membership uh, of about 17,000 members around the world, 50% of who are based outside the UK. So this data is just so important for us. We welcome all research and evidence that helps us to keep making the case for investment in maternity care. This came about loud and wide from each of those papers to improve health of women and families around the globe. The findings of this series is hugely important to our work. It highlights that to improve maternal health, we need to move away from that disease-focused approach to a model that takes into consideration not only the intrinsic biological factors, but the extrinsic factors as well, such as poor education, healthcare resources, gender-based violence, what was so nicely described by Shakila as vulnerability attributes. The RCOG supports the life course approach, which is so important when we look at conditions such as incontinence and prolapse, which are described in paper, in paper three, which often become evident only late on in life. So what can the RCOG and other professional associations do with this data? Well, a lot. One of the strengths of the RCOG is advocacy for women. And we can use this data to advocate for increased resources in maternal health, not only at the time of pregnancy and immediately childbirth, but also in the long term. We also knew, know that there's huge data gap. So there needs investment, not only in healthcare, but in research to identify them and then act on them. But more importantly, educating women and healthcare professionals, empowering women with, uh, with this, this data uh, that, that again is highlighted in very many papers because what we need in the center of all this is the woman's voice. The findings of this paper, and I'm going to take this to our education department, needs to be a vital part of curriculum. Curriculum that needs to start in medical schools, then go into undergraduate and postgraduate education. This series has highlighted that multidisciplinary working and training is so important. And this is one of the focus of RCOG. We work very closely with the Royal College of Midwives 
to introduce training and working together. We also have our guidelines, our green top guidelines, which are well known globally. And this data can be used to inform our guidelines. But more importantly, look at how we can adapt them to different countries, different societies. Because what was very evident in paper four that it's so important to understand ethnicity, understand the social determinants that define maternal health. We also have a huge resource of information for mothers, which is available in different formats, in different languages. And again, this data can be used to inform that. But I truly believe that just one institute or one person cannot bring about change. It's really important that policymakers, healthcare workers, researchers, educationists, and more importantly, women work together so that women can receive personalized care and improve their health outcomes. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for reiterating. It's so wonderful to have such great champions as yourselves who are taking forward the agenda in terms of training, changing mindsets, guidelines, research. Um, it's really impressive. And I really value that you highlighted women's voices at the center of all of this which was also brought forward in the series. I wonder, we have just a few minutes left. We have just two minutes. So I wonder if um, each of you in closing could uh, maybe in 30 seconds reflect on, um, the series talked about how we need to change the way we think about maternal health uh, to broaden our view. And you've listed a series of actions that you're, from your positions that you think are critical. What do you think is the biggest uh, game changer or risk that you think we should be doing in changing the way we advocate for maternal health that would make a difference? Uh, maybe first to Hadisa, uh, what what do you see some uh, is a key thing that you'd like to do differently based on coming out of the series? I, I think it's the involvement of every single stakeholder. Maternal health is beyond the health system. Maternal health is, uh, involves the um, educational system, uh, the economic system, the transport system, the environmental system, the security, the political. And each of these stakeholders has a role. And we need to streamline the role and we need to move, you know, we need to work in synergy. Uh, every single stakeholder is important and every single stakeholder has a role. And if he plays that role, then we will be able to achieve our goal. Excellent, thank you. Really to elevate maternal health, we need a whole of society approach. Um, Pisake, from your point of view, um, what do you think is a way, something you'd like to change in the way we advocate for maternal health? Unfortunately, you're on mute again. So sorry again. Thank you, thank you. Uh, although implementation of evidence-based recommendation is very important in reducing uh, maternal mortality and morbidity, as well as reducing over medicalization. Focusing solely on biomedical cause of maternal mortality is insufficient. A broader approach is necessary to tackle determinants that act upstream in the chain of events leading to severe mobility and mortality. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So really changing our mindsets away from biomedical interventions to the broader context. Rani, your last <laughs> concluding thoughts um, to close Thank the you. panel. Uh, so, so paper three highlights that a third of new mothers worldwide have lasting health issues after childbirth. That equates to 40 million women a year. Uh, as we saw, these conditions are often neglected, even though they have a severe impact on a woman's quality of life. There is a need for greater recognition amongst healthcare professionals, funding for healthcare, and research to identify health gaps and improve guidelines, especially in low and middle income countries. Thank you so much. So breaking the silence and broadening our, you know, our acknowledgement our understanding of maternal health so we can advocate for it. Thank you so much to all the panelists. And I'm gonna hand back to Femi to close us out 
Thank you to The Lancet and all the partners that came together to bring this series to fruition. Thanks very much, Hasha. Thanks to the panel members. And thanks to everyone who has joined this webinar. We are really excited today uh, that this this work that has started for the last two years is uh, has uh, finally uh, been, been published. Uh, we hope that the presentations and discussions have provided you with new perspectives on how to address maternal health in your various uh, contexts. The question that you might have after all of this presentation is, so what? You know, what are the next steps? Um, at the moment, there are four key areas where we would like to focus. One is on dissemination. We want to uh, ensure that the information in this series is shared uh, as far and as wide as possible. Please share the papers through your networks, including to all of the stakeholders that we uh, I mentioned before. We will continue the dissemination activities through most of 2024. We'll take opportunity of international and national conferences to continue to spread the message while at the same time, we'll be looking for opportunities to address the issues that have emerged from this work. In terms of research, um, the series papers all came up with several research gaps that need to be addressed. We're calling on research institutions to explore how to address the most important research gaps. WHO will be happy to provide technical support and guidance to research institutions that are keen to address some of these research gaps. In terms of guideline development, maternal health guidelines have generally been focused on clinical issues within the remit of pregnancy, childbirth, and postnatal period. We want to encourage both international and national guideline developers to start looking at the neglected conditions that Joshua highlighted uh, in paper three to provide guidance to healthcare professionals as well as uh, the healthcare recipients. WHO already started looking at uh, sexual health conditions after pregnancy as a starting point. And lastly, uh, global and national advocacy. It is crucial, as you heard from the last panel, for all of us, especially those of us working in multilateral and bilateral organizations, to engage in health diplomacy, to address the intersections between sexual and reproductive health, maternal and prenatal health, as well as maternal mortality using human rights-based approach. Lastly, I want to give a huge thanks on behalf of the, you know, several people who worked on this, on behalf of the World Health Organization, a huge thanks to all of the co-authors of this series, as well as their institutions for protecting their time to work on this series pro bono. This was only possible because of them. I want to thank all of the leads of the papers, uh, Joe Polo, Luis Tienade, Joshua, Jenny Jong, uh, Megan, Jamila, John, Alote, Shakila, everybody, including those that I don't, I, I don't have mentioned. Big thanks to the Lancet Global Health and eClinical Medicine and, and the Lancet uh, journals in general for giving us the opportunity, uh, for not giving up on us, <laughs> despite the, all the delays. Um, big thanks to WHO, uh, HRP, USAID for providing some modest funding support without which this wouldn't have been possible. Um, I want to also appreciate the communication team, uh, Natalie Bailey from WHO HRP comms team and Laura Keenan from WHO Department of Communication. They've done a huge amount of work to get all of, all of us in line and getting out this information and on time as well. Same for the Lancet uh, communication manager, Sean uh, Crucifix. Um, several of the communication materials that you'll be seeing over the next couple of days were developed by Lushomo uh, in South Africa. They managed to pull all the strings to ensure that several of these materials are ready for launch today. To my WHO colleagues, especially Tina Lavin, who did all the coordination chasing all the authors, making sure that we're still on track. Thank you all very much. And uh, lastly, on behalf of the WHO, HRP, and all of the institutions that are uh, too numerous to mention who participated in this work, I want to say a big thank you, and thanks everyone for joining, and bye for now. And right on time too. <laughs> Cheers, everyone. <laughs>